Welcome to another Subways IO 101, where we cover the basics on how our rail infrastructure works. I'm Amber, and today we're going to cover signaling and how it works in the NYCT network. Before we get into the details of CBTC, communication-based train control, let's review the basics of how the current subway system works. Traction current and return. While most people focus on the third rail, which supplies power to the train, the running rails are equally important. One of these rails isn't just for support. It acts as a negative return for the traction circuit. This completes the circuit, allowing electricity to flow from the third rail, positive, through the train and back to the substation via the return rail, negative. Grounding brushes on the train ensure a good connection for the return current. The goal is to minimize resistance and power loss. In some parts of the New York City transit system, a fourth rail is added to further improve the return path. See our video on fourth rails for more details. Signaling. The second running rail is dedicated to signaling. It uses an AC phase track circuit system, operating at either 25 Hz or 60 Hz at around 10 to 12 volts to detect the presence of trains. The track is divided into blocks, and when a train enters a block, it disrupts the circuit, triggering relays that control various signaling equipment, such as trip arms and timers. This is how the system tracks train locations and enforces speed limits. Historically, double-tracked impedance blocks were common on the NYCT network, but now they are mostly limited to the IND's Archer Avenue line. The use of DC for traction and AC for signaling allows for a three-rail setup with minimal interference between the two systems. In contrast, London's system uses DC for both traction and signaling, requiring a fourth rail for the signal return to avoid interference. This fourth rail also reduces electrolysis and leakage. Now that we understand the basics, let's move on to discussing signal and the blocks they enforce. Most of our routes rely on the fixed block signal system. This system divides the mainline track into consecutive segments called signal blocks, each with a fixed signal at its entrance. These signals inform train operators whether it's safe to proceed into the block. In automatic areas, sections without switches, signal aspects are determined solely by train movement. The system ensures safety by reflecting the real-time location of trains. It operates using the AC power phase circuit. When a train enters a block, its wheels create a short circuit, track circuit, diverting electricity, and changing the signal to red. This alerts any approaching train that the block is occupied. With that said, the fixed block signaling is inherently fail-safe. Any system malfunction interrupts the electricity flow, turning signals red even without trains present, prioritizing safety. Now on to the signals themselves. There are three types we're going to cover in this breakdown, with the first being an automatic signal. It's a fixed signal capable of exhibiting three distinct aspects, green, yellow, or red, and is solely controlled by train movement. It also lacks an X on its signal identification plate. The three aspects are green, which indicates you're good to proceed, yellow, proceed with caution, prepared to stop at the next signal, and red indicating stop. Green and yellow are considered clear signals, while red is a danger signal. A train operator passing a green signal should never encounter a red signal without first seeing a yellow one. To reinforce safety, Mainline fixed signals have automatic stop arms that raise and lower with the signal's aspect. A raised stop arm is in the tripping position, engaging a train's emergency brakes if it attempts to pass. Now let's talk about fail-safes. The system uses a two-block setup system. It's important to note, the fixed block system doesn't pinpoint a train's exact location within a block, only whether a part of it is inside. When a train occupies any part of a block, at least two consecutive red signals must be displayed behind it. This two-block signal protection ensures a safe stopping distance for a following train. Signal spacing is carefully engineered to provide a safe margin behind each train based on track configuration and speed limits. Even at maximum speed, a train encountering a red signal will have ample time and distance to stop before reaching the train ahead. This design prevents collisions and ensures continuous safety. Our second type is an interlocking or home signal which is a fixed, lighted signal used in the subway system to govern train movements in areas where signals and switches can be controlled by either a tower or the rail control center, RCC. Here are the key features of interlocking signals. They are fully controlled. Interlocking signals, except for the marker signal, are controlled by a tower or the RCC. 
they set up route lineups. When a tower or the RCC allows an interlocking signal to display a clear aspect, it is referred to as issuing a lineup to the train. How to identify? These signals almost always contain an X on their signal identification plate, with some exceptions. Home signals fall into two categories, standard home and low home signals. Here are the basics of standard home signals. From an identification standpoint, they always display an X and a number on one of the signal identification plates. From a protection standpoint, it may be used to protect one or more switches. A standard home also contains two signal masks. The top mast conveys condition or track occupancy, with the bottom mast conveys the route that the associated switch is set for. We'll cover this visually in a separate short. Home signals also contain a call-on indicator light. It's the single yellow lens at the bottom mast setup. It's also important to note that the associated insulated joint is always adjacent to the signal with the affiliated stop arm. Other signal types, the IJs, can be offset by up to 12 feet. And lastly, on to key by. A home signal can never be keyed by. Don't worry if you are not familiar with the key by function will it cover in a future video. Here's a breakdown to help you understand a home signal. As a reminder, a standard home signal consists of two masts. The top mast indicates the condition or track occupancy of the track ahead. A top green indicates proceed at the allowable speed, anticipating the next signal to be clear. A top yellow indicates proceed with caution and be prepared to stop at the next signal. A top red, stop. Since the signal is tower controlled, this is referred to as stop and stay. The bottom mast indicates the route that the signal and associated switches are set for. A bottom green indicates the main route the train is continuing straight. A bottom yellow indicates a diverging route. The train is taking the switch. And a bottom red indicates no route is established. Stop and stay. Now let's break it down. A green over green signal at 59th Street Columbus Circle on track A3 indicates a clear mainline lineup for a southbound Apple or A train. On the other hand, a green over yellow on A3 means it's clear ahead you're taking a diverging route or switch. This would be a Delta or D train lineup and switch track feeding into track B3 and the 6th Avenue line. Another type of home signal is the low home signal, found in yards and on main lines for reverse movements. When encountering these in yards, you need verbal permission from the yard dispatcher before moving a train, even if the signal is clear. Key differences from standard home signals. They have a single mass, not two. Most lack associated stop arms. They only display red or yellow aspects. And you must visually confirm the switch position. Signal meanings. Red over red, stop and stay. Yellow. Proceed with caution. Be prepared to stop within half your range of vision and expect to find a train ahead. Home and approach signals are also controlled directly by the tower in a traditional setup. This is controlled along with the track switches by a tower and interlocking machine, and monitoring is done using model boards. In the case of the A Division or IRT, RCC or Rail Control Center has remote interlocking control along with master towers. This is achieved by using a standalone deployment of automatic train supervision on the IRT or ATSA. This also digitizes monitoring with more accurate location tracking with undercar AVLs that ties into the customer information system. Thus, the more accurate IRT countdown clocks, as I'm sure you've noticed. ATS is only deployed in the BMT and IND, alongside CBTC and its other modules and setups like ATP, AWS, and ATO, this also gives RCC remote access and tie-ins into ISMB and other management software like TDS and iTrack. Outside these setups, it's standard tower monitoring and operations, along with operator input from punch boxes. We'll cover this a bit more in detail in our up-and-coming CBTC 101. As we've learned, standard home signals are typically controlled directly by a tower. However, there's an option to automate a home signal using a function called fleeting. This relay works in conjunction with the home signal, automatically clearing it for the same route based on the conditions of the track or block ahead. This would be used for unmanned towers. The last signal type we'll cover today is the approach signal, which resembles an automatic signal. However, it is tower controlled and can be identified by a white plate with a black X on the side of the signal. This signal works in conjunction with a home signal and governs the approach to it. While the approach signal is primarily controlled by a tower or RCC, it is also influenced by train movement. 
If the track circuit ahead of the approach signal is occupied, the signal will display a red aspect, regardless of any actions taken by the tower or RCC. Even if the tower or RCC sets the signal to clear, it will only actually clear when the block ahead is no longer occupied. Each signal type is vital in managing and safeguarding tracks and trains. Signal blocks vary in length, determined by the maximum permitted speed on that track section and the train's braking capabilities. This guarantees that if a train triggers a trip arm, it will stop safely within the block's designated space. Over time, block spacing has been adapted to accommodate changes in brake materials and performance. Blocks situated between stations are typically longer, allowing for faster train speeds. In contrast, stations utilize shorter blocks, enabling trains to operate closer together due to their reduced speeds in these areas. This is further supported by additional safety features, such as station timers and wheel detectors, which we'll discuss in a future video. Signals are also equipped with automatic stop arms, as stated earlier in the breakdown. They are positioned at the entry to the block that raises and lower in conjunction with the signal's aspect. When the stop arm is raised, it is in the tripping position and will engage the carborne tripping device of any train that attempts to pass it, triggering the train's emergency brakes. Automatic stop arms are located on the field side of one of the running rails near the associated signal. In subdivision A, they are on the field side of the running rail on the train operator's side. In subdivision B, they are on the field side opposite the train operator's side. Automatic stop arms have two positions, the tripping position, raised, and the clear position, lowered. There are two types of stop arms, electric, raised at 45 degrees, and pneumatic, raised at 90 degrees. An automatic stop arm is designed never to raise into the tripping position beneath the train it is intended to protect, a feature known as the retention feature. When a train passes a signal, causing it to change to red as the first set of wheels bridges the insulated joint, the stop arm will not raise immediately. This prevents the carborne tripping device from activating on a subsequent car of the same train. I hope this has given you a clearer picture of the signal system used in the New York City subway. It also lays the groundwork for our next unit, where we'll cover traction power and basic train subsystems. If you enjoyed this and would like to see more content like this, consider liking and subscribing, as it really helps our channel. If you'd like to support us further, you can buy us a coffee by clicking the link in the description. I'm Amber, along with Ashley and Rob from Subways.io. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.